Okay, good evening, everyone. My name is John Ravenhill. It's my privilege to be the director of the Balsillie School of International Affairs, and great pleasure to welcome everyone this evening. Um, this is a very special event. Um, the school is very much the junior partner in this event this evening. Um, we are partnering with Laurier, um, especially with Laurier's International Migration Research Center, um, but also with the Canadian International Council. And why this is very special is that the Council has just relaunched in Waterloo, and this, I believe, is the second of their events. And our speaker this evening is going to tell you a bit more about the Council and its plans for the Waterloo region. So that's all I'm going to say this evening, just a very warm welcome. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alison Mance, who is the Director of Laurier's International Migration Research Centre. Um, Hello, good evening, welcome, and thank you all so much for being here. As John said, I'm Alison Mounts. I direct the International Migration Research Center, or IMRC, which is right upstairs here in the Balsili School. Uh, we're a community of researchers, uh, faculty, students, uh, working here in the local community and also abroad on issues related to immigration, displacement, workers, refugee health, um, citizenship. Uh, so I want to welcome you on behalf of our center and also Loria University where I'm on faculty. I also want to acknowledge that we're gathered tonight on the traditional territories of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. There are of course long histories of migration and displacement and struggles over belonging here um, in this region that are of course important to remember when we discuss contemporary migrations and displacements and all of the territorial politics surrounding them. I want to thank those who funded tonight's event uh, and who organized it, including our provost and vice president academic, that's Rob Gordon, uh, the Canadian International Council, which we'll hear more about shortly, uh, including the Waterloo branch and its president, uh, Laszlo Sarkany. I'm also grateful to Laurier International and the staff here at the Balsili School, and of course, the coordinator of our center, Sean Lockwood, for all of the work that they put into organizing for tonight. It's really difficult to imagine a more important topic of conversation than the one we've gathered tonight to discuss. Globally, of course, we're experiencing the displacement of a historically high number of people um, since the aftermath of World War II when the global community designed the architecture to govern immigration and displacement. And at the precise moment that we're experiencing and witnessing this high number of people displaced, we're also experiencing, of course, a rise around the globe in xenophobia and racism and anti-immigrant sentiments and actions and politics. So these aren't just kind of fringe uh, movements, but things that are making their way into very mainstream um, government policies and political parties. They're affecting those who are displaced, of course, and, and marginalized, but also mainstream political parties and the institutions that are designed to govern. So these are issues that affect all of us, and it's important that we come together to find out more information and analysis and enter into dialogue about them. And we're very fortunate to have Ben Rosewell here with us tonight to talk about the issues. Our format is that Ben is going to talk to you, um, and then we will sit down for a brief conversation and then open the floor, and you'll see there are microphones uh, at the front of the room, and we join you to, to ask questions, provide comments, and enter into dialogue. So it's my um, honor to introduce you now to our speaker, Ben Rosewell. Uh, ben was appointed President and Research Director of the Canadian International Council in November of last year. He has 25 years of experience as a practitioner of international relations. He earned his expertise in international security with the UN in Mogadishu, Somalia in 1993 as Canada's first diplomatic envoy, to, part of the first diplomatic envoy to Baghdad, Iraq after the fall of Saddam Hussein and as the head of NATO provincial reconstruction team in Kandahar at the height of Canada's involvement in Afghanistan. Ben has advised top levels of government on international strategy in the Privy Council office during the tenures of Prime Ministers Jean Chrétien and Stephen Harper, 
and at the Washington DC Center for Strategic and International Studies from 2003 to 2004. But his abiding passion is the defense of human rights and democracy. He established the Democracy Unit of Global Affairs Canada, worked closely with human rights movements as a political officer in the Canadian Embassy to Egypt, and most recently as Canada's ambassador to Venezuela from 2014 to 2017. Throughout his career, Ben has sought to engage citizens in the practice of international relations after a fellowship at Stanford University that introduced him to the powerful role that individuals can play in global affairs, he pioneered the practice of digital diplomacy at Global Affairs Canada. This same passion led him to join Farhan Ladani in founding software startup called Better Place, which creates opportunities for citizens to engage in civic action through a mobile app. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ben Rosewell. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for that warm welcome. Uh, I think it's really extraordinary to see so many centers of expertise on international relations here in Waterloo. This is really an emerging center, I think, for, uh, for the Canadian um, discussion on our role in the world. And so it's a real honor to partner with uh, the Balsilli School of International Affairs and the International Migration Research Center within it. And uh, a big thanks to Rob Gordon, the provost and vice president of academic who was uh, the original inspiration behind uh, tonight's event. Uh, yes, we are relaunching the Waterloo chapter of the Canadian International Council under the leadership of, uh, of Laszlo, and we'll be talking shortly uh, towards the end of some future events. But I wanted to start this discussion by explaining the history of the CIC, uh, what it is we do, and uh, why you should all become members. The CIA's... Um, CIC's predecessor was called the Canadian Institute for International Affairs, and it had its origins in an event that happened 100 years ago. That was the Paris Peace Talks that put an end to the First World War. That was the very first time that Canada exercised an independent role in international diplomacy. Back in 1919, we didn't control our own foreign policy that was still run out of London, but we had earned the right through the soldiers uh, that had died, Canadian soldiers that had died in First World War, uh, under Prime Minister Robert Borden, we insisted on having our own independent presence at that peace talks. Well, the delegates that were gathered in Paris for that year, from January 1919 to January 2020, when the Treaty of Versailles was signed, uh, came to be increasingly concerned over the course of that year at the scale and uh, severity of the international challenges the world was still facing even after the war had ended, on the one hand, and the isolation, the distance that most Canadians felt from those trends. Those obviously had drawn us into a very bloody conflict in 1914, and many Canadians lived under the hope that we wouldn't um, be bothered to that extent, that we wouldn't be drawn into the world's conflicts again. But the Versailles delegates sensed that that was not likely to be the case. And so when they returned to Canada, they established the CIIA in five cities across the, uh, the country. The goal was not necessarily to shape decision-making in Ottawa, but rather to engage the Canadian public on issues facing the world and to increase our level as citizens, our level of knowledge and information, and our ability uh, to parse what's happening in the international system. Now we have 15 branches from coast to coast in seven different provinces and 1,500 uh, close to 1,500 members. Uh, in those early years, the 1920s and the 1930s, some of the principal issues being discussed by CIIA chapters across the country was the rise of two disturbing new ideologies that presented alternatives to liberal democracy that were gaining currency in some of the most important countries in the world with frightening consequences for international relations and which potentially well, had the potential to gain some currency in Canada as well, because fascism and communism had uh, deep roots in countries that were not that dissimilar to Canada. Uh, to honor that tradition, 100 years later, I would like to use this opportunity uh, to share my concerns about another ideology that has taken root in many countries around the world that are similar to Canada, and which has the potential to also take root in Canada if we're not careful. That um, phenomenon, uh, we could debate what the term 
could be. Uh, populism is the term that I will use. I know that it's a contested concept, and there's many different ways of understanding populism. But I come not so much as a scholar, as uh, an observer in my international experience, having seen a system by which aspirants to political power compete for that power, the relationship that they attempt to establish with individuals of the country, and the way that they exercise power once they gain it. I believe that there's a coherent system, a coherent set of techniques uh, that can be observed in countries uh, of very different geographic locations and very different um, policy prescriptions. So there's a populism of the left, a populism of the right, and many other forms of populism that all follow a very similar logic. And that's why I would argue that uh, we should consider them uh, a, single, um, a single ideological phenomenon. I will also go on to argue that in spite of the impression that populism might be consistent and perhaps even helpful to democracy, since it refers to the people and democracy is about giving power to the people, that in practice, and it's always practice that matters more than theory, populism is inherently anti-democratic. That in the populist systems, certainly the one that I observed in Venezuela, and in the trends that we're seeing in other countries that have adopted populist rule, the outcomes tend to reduce the power that individuals have over the politics of their country and their ability to influence who has power and how it's exercised. And to that end, I'm going to argue that populism is inherently anti-democratic. Let me turn to Venezuela, which is the case where I've had um, the, most, the deepest experience. Venezuela is uh, an interesting country for Canadian citizens um, to think about because while it's in a very different place from where Canada is right now, and thank God for, for from our perspective that uh, we live in such a different situation that what most, most Venezuelans have to put up with now, the countries are actually quite similar in many ways. They're both established uh, in the 19th century. They're about the same size population, about 35 million in both countries. They're both countries uh, that have been marked by high levels of uh, immigration, probably more so uh, focused on Europe in the case of Venezuela. Um, there's less of a diversity of, uh, of sources of immigration uh, to Canada, but it's a, a country that's very much built on immigration. And of course, uh, with a lot of that immigration displacing a native population, which also coincidentally is almost exactly the same size as our native population, about 3% of, uh, uh, of the whole. Throughout most of the 20th century, Venezuela was also a model of political stability and economic prosperity. The most prosperous country in all of Latin America and the most uh, democratic uh, nation of South America, certainly since the 1958 uh, revolution that put an end to military dictatorship and ushered in a democratic uh, era in Venezuela that was the envy of the rest of Latin America. Venezuela more or less overthrew the military yoke under which all Latin American countries labored through most of the 20th century, a full generation before any, uh, any other Latin American country, and as a result was the lodestar for, uh, for democracy and human rights in all of Latin America. Whenever there was a military dictatorship that would crush a human rights movement in other countries and those activists would flee into exile, they would invariably travel to Caracas. Uh, and the memory of Venezuela hosting so many human rights and democracy activists over the years is very much alive and well in other Latin American capitals where some of those former activists have gone on to become presidents and uh, foreign ministers. One of the reasons why you're seeing such a surprising degree of support uh, for the democracy movement in Venezuela from across Latin America, with some notable exceptions, but the vast majority of, of Latin Americans um, have uh, spoken out in, uh, in, in favor of the, uh, the democracy movement in Venezuela. As a result, there's a, um, a nostalgia for a time when Venezuela was a leader in democracy and human rights. It was also a fabulously wealthy country, uh, but that is due to both a blessing and a curse that Venezuela has lived under since the 1920s when oil was discovered under its soil. It is the country with the largest proven oil reserves in the world, larger even than Saudi Arabia. Also, another similarity with Canada, the dominant form of, uh, of uh, uh, bitumen in Venezuela 
is a very heavy crude, very similar to the kind that we have in our uh, tar sands. And so there's been a lot that, a lot that our countries have, uh, have had in common over the years, and we traditionally have had an extremely strong bilateral relationship. Our embassy in Caracas was the largest embassy in all of Latin America for most of the 20th century because of the, the scale of our trade and investment relationships as well as our political similarities. The big difference, I would say, in economic terms, is that where Canada relies on the sale of oil and gas for 3% of our national income, in the late, 19th cent uh, late 20th century, Venezuela relied on it for 75% of their income. And that made them extraordinarily vulnerable to the vagaries of the uh, international oil market. In 1973, when the oil the price of oil shot through the roof. Venezuela fr went from being quite a stable, uh, prosperous country to being one that was fabulously wealthy and that almost didn't know what to do with all of its oil riches. Under the uh, progressive, left of center leadership at the time of a president called Carlos Andres Perez, there were very grand schemes laid uh, to uh, educate the population, to send the cream of the crop of Venezuelan uh, high school students abroad to study in international elite universities in the United States and the United Kingdom and elsewhere. There was uh, attempts to launch very ambitious social programs to, uh, to return some of the, uh, the oil wealth um, to, the, uh, to the poorer parts of the population. And there were attempts to reduce the, the reliance on oil, for example, by creating a massive hydroelectric project, the largest in South America, uh, in the southeast, in the jungle of the southeast of the country. Unfortunately, that oil boom was short-lived from a Venezuelan perspective because in 1982, the pendulum swung very dramatically in the opposite direction. We had a recession in Canada in the early 80s. It was nothing compared to what the Venezuelans had to endure when the average price of oil went from $79 a barrel to $9 a barrel. It was an economic shock uh, along the lines that it had, uh, it had never seen before in its history. And it created... Uh, First the boom and then the bust created tremendous social problems. The boom created a mass urbanization where all of a sudden it didn't make economic sense to be a farmer or to be uh, running small businesses in the countryside or in the smaller towns of Venezuela. And there was this massive rush to the capital with Venezuela booming um, to the size that it now enjoys at six million. It's about the size of Toronto. But to house that many people in such a short amount of time overwhelmed the infrastructure of, uh, of Venezuela. And so the vast majority of that population lived in shanty towns and they, in the hills around, uh, around Caracas. They created a new class of Venezuelans, uh, the urban poor, which hadn't existed in significant numbers up until the 1970s. And of course, as in any economic crisis, it's the poor that suffers the most, and that population suffered tremendously in the 1980s and the 1990s. Um, this was also a time of some significant economic orthodoxy across the world. This was the years of the Washington Consensus, and so some of the policies adopted by the Venezuelan governments in the 1980s uh, placed an inordinate faith in the power of the market to solve certain deep-rooted social and economic uh, imbalances. Mistakes uh, were rife in this period, and in 1989, they prompted uh, an, an extremely violent event, which was called the Caracaso. Uh, this was prompted shortly after a left-of-center government was elected, and shortly after the incoming president uh, came, uh, was briefed by the scale of the economic challenges was facing, very suddenly adopted quite a strict um, policy of, uh, of macroeconomic stabilization, as proposed by the IMF and the World Bank. And one of the measures that he introduced was to triple the cost of uh, gasoline. Gasoline had been more or less free for the population under the logic that we're the largest oil producing company in the world, and therefore oil should belong to the, the people. The oil industry had been nationalized many, many years before. So when the price of oil tripled, it created riots in some of the distant commuter bus lines um, servicing this extended population outside Caracas. All hell literally broke loose. It took 
somewhere between 10 days and two weeks for order to be established in Caracas. And in that time, a minimum of 300 people were killed. Some claim there was as much as 2,000 people. Essentially, law and order completely collapsed. That left quite a scar in the psyche of Venezuela. And while liberal democracy continued for 10 years after that, with an alternation of governments each introducing policies to try and address some of these deep-seated economic and social calamities, there was something broken in the political mindset of Venezuelans. This was a society under, under tremendous stress. And as succeeding political parties being elected through free and fair elections proved uh, unable to come up with a set of policies that would, uh, that would restore some stability to the economy, there was uh, increasing dissatisfaction with the existing political system. Uh, not unlike today, the effects of this unequal growth and the instability that, um, that the, the, the price of oil had introduced created some, um, some real uncertainty in the lives of everyday uh, Venezuelans. Ironically, in this final period from 1996 to 1999, there was uh, quite a successful administration under a president called Rafael Caldera who had managed to tame hyperinflation, introduced some policies that had uh, begun to re redistribute wealth significantly to uh, to the urban poor. Um, but this was at a time that another aspirant for political power was on the rise, one who adopted a very different playbook. His name was Hugo Chavez, and he came with a few things that were that endeared him to the Venezuelan people. The first is that he had a, a narrative, uh, an explanation for the ills in Venezuelan society, where he pointed to a profound and enduring permanent division between uh, the rich and the poor and argued that it was the fault of certain Venezuelans against other Venezuelans. He also had a tremendous talent for communications. Uh, he had launched uh, a pair of very um, dramatic coup d'etats in 1992, which had killed a total of about 100 people. Between the two of them, relatively small in uh, the scale of bloodshed of other coup d'etats in Latin America, uh, but it also pr produced a tremendous um, uh, impression in the public mindset of someone who was willing to go to extraordinary lengths to try and break some of the problems that had beset Venezuela. Uh, he was also able to leverage a very rich current of anti-American sentiment, which runs very deep in, uh, in Latin America uh, for very good reasons, building on quite a, a long history of American intervention uh, in the region. Uh, but he wove that uh, narrative about the, divi the fundamental division in their, in their society between rich and poor in with uh, fierce critique of uh, American foreign policy as being in, uh, in active collaboration with the rich of the country uh, to deprive the, the poor of their, of their just due. He also claimed that the institutions of representative democracy were not part of the solution, but part of the problem and needed uh, radical overhaul. Chavez was elected in 1998, late 1998. He was up against a beauty queen. Uh, in retrospect, probably not the best contender for a political office that the uh, more traditional parties could have put forward. Um, he won handily. And he was good to his word. He introduced uh, a total change in the Constitution uh, shortly after he came to power. Um, at this point, Venezuelans were so exhausted from 20 years of economic stability that in the initial years, there was quite a wide degree of uh, uh, willingness to, to see where Ch Chavez would, uh, would take things. And the new Constitution, the one that he introduced in 1999, incidentally, is the one that's uh, become so controversial recently for some of the provisions that it that it uh, has in its uh, Article 333, which allows the National Assembly uh, to fill a void in the, in the presidency by appointing the president of the National Assembly, the president of the country. Ironically, the Guaido uh, forces are invoking the Chavista Constitution as they're arguing for a restoration of the rule of law. Chavez was blessed with uh, the pendulum swinging once again. So if the pendulum had swung towards a severe drop in the price of oil in 1982, it came back roaring uh, shortly after he was elected and stayed high for the entire time that he was 
uh, president. It averaged at above $100 uh, per barrel for many of the years that he was in, uh, he was in office. And it was a heady time for Venezuela. There were some significant strides made in the redistribution of wealth. There was some very innovative social policies that attempted to redistribute the population and some things that had never been thought of before. For example, Venezuela, Venezuela is um, the first, or Caracas is the first city in the world that uses a, a gondola to transport um, commuters um, from these shanty towns. One of the innovative policies the Chavez government came was Let's just lift them up above the traffic and carry them to downtown. So if you're in, in Caracas, you'll see these like skiing gondolas going over. It was a, it was a government that was uh, really quite creative in some of the solutions that it came with and had this tremendous uh, resources, something like $700 billion uh, of uh, surplus oil revenue that was earned in this time. I arrived in Venezuela at the tail end of this. Chavez had just recently died uh, in March of 2013, and I arrived in... March of 2014, so exactly a year into the mandate of the new president, Nicolas Maduro. And I saw some of the positive impacts and the negative impacts of the Chavista period in, uh, in power. There was still the urban poor, and uh, there were still some uh, significant levels of poverty among the, uh, among the urban population. Um, there was... Uh, some greater inclusion that, they, uh, that these populations had earned in the political system. Uh, and yet there was also a deep, deep division in the country. There were, it, was, it was as if Venezuelans had two radically different stories about what their country was, what the problems were, and what the solutions would be. It often felt as if um, these two sets of Venezuelans hadn't talked to each other in many, many years. Uh, Unfortunately for Venezuela, the pendulum swung again in 2014. So shortly after I was there, uh, the price of oil dropped dramatically once again. Now, it only dropped to, from $100 to $45 the second time, not nearly as severe as the drop in the 1980s, and yet it was absolutely devastating for the Venezuelan economy. And this is where I'd like to introduce the discussion about populism, because the methods, the techniques that, you, that Chavez had introduced had uh, polarized the country to such an extent that the Maduro government proved unable, and depending on your political perspective, unwilling to address the scale of the economic calamity that came when oil dropped in 2014. Let me go through those four aspects that I alluded to very quickly. And these are the four aspects uh, the political methods of populism that we see in many countries around the world. The first was a narrative of division. The starting point for Chavez's analysis of Venezuela is that the country is profoundly and fundamentally divided. This is not a country that is uh, coming together around a common set of ideals. Rather, it's a country that's fundamentally and permanently divided between the rich and the poor. There, the second element is this obsession with communications, um, which had created a, a strong bond between Chavez and uh, many of the individual voters in Venezuela. Uh, he was one of the first um, recent world leaders uh, to invest very heavily in communications, it was originally in television. Chavez was famous for being the television president. He would host an, a weekly television news program, or television program where he would host and he would receive guests every single week. It was called Allo Presidente, and it would, uh, it would take three or four hours and it would be broadcast on every single TV screen across the country. This uh, at first seemed to be just a novel way of communicating with the population, uh, but it, over time it actually became the principal venue for significant decisions that the president would make. He would govern on television. Uh, he was a phenomenal entertainer, uh, and when you're actually seeing a president make decisions live, uh, sometimes life and death decisions, uh, it turned out to be pretty riveting television. Uh, it got to the point that many cabinet ministers wouldn't, secure, wouldn't be able to secure time with the president unless they showed up on the television, and so cabinet ministers would come with their briefings about 
what was happening with the hydroelectric uh, dam or um, issues related to the Aboriginal population in the south, or uh, the foreign minister would come in and talk about a dispute with the United States, and he would have his discussion with the president live and on TV. I suppose you might see it as an act of radical transparency. Once um, Chavez actually made preparations for war on his television program, and there'd been a spat with Colombia, he called his uh, minister of defense and chief of defense staff onto the show and gave them instructions live on TV to start preparing plans for an invasion of Colombian territory by air, sea, and land. It was riveting television. Um, and yet, there was a, uh, there was a concomitant um, reduction in the amount of policymaking that the government was doing off screen. Most of the actual work of the governing of the country was being conducted uh, on screen. And as a result, uh, Chavez was able to establish this direct contact with the population. Now, it's relatively uh, common for, for politicians to want to uh, establish that kind of direct discussion with, uh, with voters and to have a, a narrative that they, they attempt to, uh, to impose on others. What, was, what seemed unique about Chavez at the time, and we've since seen as quite common to populist leaders of all stripes, uh, is that he would consistently turn the attention to topics that were extremely divisive in Venezuelan politics. He would come back over and over again to hot-button issues, uh, knowing that they would further divide the population. One of them was the Caracaso, so I referred to that traumatic event that Venezuelans had, had experienced in 19. 89. There were a, a quite a lot of human rights abuses connected in that time, and there were NGOs that had compiled long lists of uh, arbitrary disappearances, of murder by, by police forces, of seizure of property, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Those NGOs, however, were frozen out of government and were uh, hounded by the, uh, by the government, while President Chavez would continually revisit the, uh, the horrors of 1989, rather than trying to address them and introduce justice and help the society and move on. Uh, f in other words, what he attempted to do was to reopen the wound of the Caracaso over and over again. After mass protests in 2002 that uh, were ultimately taken over by um, uh, coup plotters uh, associated with the Chamber of Commerce, there was a two-day period in which there were pitched battles, military battles, which Chavez uh, ultimately won and returned uh, to power, so another extremely divisive event in Venezuelan uh, politics. During that um, two days of, uh, of battle, urban battle, as the, the Chavista forces were attempting to regain power, there was famous footage of a shooting incident on a bridge uh, over a very busy intersection in downtown Caracas, which resulted in the death of 11 people. The Video footage is extremely ambiguous, and both sides claim that the 11 victims uh, were on their side and were shot by the other side. Um, there, these cases were never brought uh, to justice. Rather, they fed into the president's weekly television programs for the subsequent years, reliving the trauma of that movement over and over again. Populists have a tendency, in other words, to burn the middle ground. There is a, a point to the communications, the heavy emphasis on communications, which is to establish an emotional bond between the part of the population that the populace appeal to with the charismatic leader. And part and parcel of that is also to create an emotional reaction between the part of the population that is being demonized by the charismatic leader. Either emotional reactions serve the interests of the, uh, of the leader because it places the charismatic leader at the center of attention in the country. Whether you love him or you hate him, you're talking about him, and he is setting the agenda. The third element was the, uh, the tendency to blame outside forces. In the case of Chavez uh, and his successor, Maduro, these... Uh, frequent invocation of, uh, of the ills of the, uh, of the United States. Um, when I was there, it was in the period of time that Barack Obama was president, and there was 
not really a week or two weeks that would go by without some fresh news of a coup that had been plotted by the U.S. Embassy against Maduro. In the time that I was there, I think we, calc we calculated that there were 48 assassination attempts claimed by the president against the United States. Now, I'm certainly no um, apologist for U.S. policy in Latin America, but it's highly unlikely that any embassy would be able to plan 48 assassination attempts in the course of just uh, a few years. Rather, it's more likely that uh, criticism of the United States was part of the narrative that helped to reinforce that emotional bond between the charismatic leader and his, uh, and his followers. Um, Canada was not exempt from this tendency to blame uh, foreigners, neither was any embassy. Um, any embassy from Western America and almost every single embassy from Latin America uh, in the time that I was there focus, was, was the focus of some kind of media, government media um, criticism and uh, conspiracy theories about, about coups being plotted, about various nefarious uh, activities. Uh, when I first arrived, I noticed that uh, fellow ambassadors were extremely reluctant to make any public remarks in, uh, in Venezuela. And their capitals, of course, were very reluctant to make any public statements against Venezuela, for example, in the OAS or the United Nations. Um, I was not exempt either in my very first few days there before I'd even had a time to meet with my staff. There was a national television program denouncing me for my collaboration with the CIA in uh, bringing in 30 special operatives uh, that were snipers that would take out the president at the first opportunity. Um, it uh, ran as a headline for three or four days. Uh, I thought my career was coming to an end <laughs> very rapidly. Um, but I was reassured by the other ambassadors that it would pass and that that had happened to almost every one of them at some point in their tenure as the representatives of their country in Venezuela. There was a, a media game that was played that was not very nice to be a part of, uh, but it seemed to be understood by the diplomatic community that it was a game and that, and, uh, uh, that the target of it would pass uh, eventually. Our efforts to engage with the Venezuelan government were also dominated by this obsession with media. The foreign minister wouldn't uh, agree to one-on-one -on -one meetings with any ambassadors, as is the case in most capitals, but instead would gather all of the ambassadors together, kind of like you, um, not allow any Q&A, uh, but to have a speech, essentially, where the foreign minister would, uh, would deliver her, in my time it was, uh, it was uh, Delcy Rodriguez, now the vice president of the country, would deliver her version of events to the international community with the cameras rolling all on live television and she would pick out certain countries that she wanted to criticize and heap abuse on them and then dismiss them, uh, dismiss them all. There was something fundamentally different in other ways about the way that the Venezuelan government engaged in uh, the day-to-day -day practice of diplomacy and the day-to-day -day practice of, of government. Finally, and I think most significantly for democracy, um, Hugo Chavez dismantled significant institutions of the Venezuelan uh, state. Uh, the constitutional reforms of 1999 uh, were uh, the constitution of a, of a democracy, a democracy with very heavy emphasis, placed power in the hands of the uh, executive uh, branch. So it wasn't so much the, but it wasn't so much the constitutional change as the efforts in subsequent years to denigrate the free media, in an independent uh, press, uh, to exert control over the, uh, over the courts, um, to marginalize the National Assembly, the legislative branch, and curiously enough, even the executive branch. This is something I found difficult to understand at first, that um, by the time I was there, Chavez was, was gone, but Maduro would often attack his own civil service, claiming that there were uh, that there were fifth columns inside the civil service that were operating against his, uh, against his deeds. They hadn't yet coined the term deep state, but there was an ongoing uh, public, uh, public relations campaign by the president of the country against his own officials. Um, the social policies for which Chavez were, was uh, so famous were not generally conducted by the public service. They were conducted by the political party, um, through missions, misiones, which would be associated with the name of a 19th century uh, hero of independence and which would involve highly publicized uh, um, 
expeditions into the neighborhoods of the urban poor to deliver health care or what have you, all very successful in, with the communities that they were targeting. But the resources for them were actually being taken out of the hospitals and the clinics that would serve the broader population. In other words, the social services provided by the states, the state, were downgraded while the s social services provided by the party would receive the bulk of the, uh, of the resources. One by one, each of these institutions uh, came to be hollowed out in the time uh, that Chavez was in power and were quite hollow by the time that I got there. But there was enough money in the system uh, that the, the worst effects of this had not yet been, uh, been felt because there had been this $700 billion bonanza. Uh, there were certainly benefits to point to as well as costs uh, to this very different way of running a state. The challenge is that when that pendulum swung and oil money disappeared, that it left the, the, the hollowed out institutions that remained were unable to cope with the, uh, with the scale of the crisis. Under Chavez, the dependence of the oil, uh, of the Venezuelan economy on oil, had risen from 75% to 96%. And so when you remove half of the value of that uh, product on the international market and 96% of your revenue in the country depends on it, it's a massive uh, external blow. Even so, there were quite a lot of oil countries uh, that went through that crisis in 2014 and 2015, which have not collapsed as countries since. And I believe that the scale and severity of the economic and, and social crisis in Venezuela today is a result primarily of the paralysis that populism had introduced in that country. Uh, there is a lot of um, rhetoric, particularly in the United States under the Trump administration, to blame socialism for the scale of the economic uh, devastation. Uh, I'm not a socialist myself, but it seems um, unlikely that socialism in itself can be s responsible for that scale of economic devastation, given the many other socialist countries in the world that, don't, that haven't lost 50% of their GDP over five years. To try and explain how the political system prevented the Venezuelan uh, state from dealing with this calamity, um, need to go back to these same four principles of populism. The narrative div of division um, is so prominent in Venezuelan politics that it overrode, the importance of maintaining that narrative overrode all other policy uh, considerations. Maduro, uh, as the president, would naturally be the the focus of many of the criticisms for the scale of this economic, uh, of this economic um, calamity. This is years and years before any sanctions were being levied, levied against Venezuela. His response was almost always to seek to blame um, the rich and the Americans. This is the, the fundamental narrative uh, of, uh, of Chavista. So for example, um, when oil, uh, when, sorry, when food prices began to rise, um, his initial response was to subsidize the price uh, of food without any concomitant benefits to, uh, to farmers, which, of course, just reduced the supply of food over time. Then as lineups started extending around grocery, uh, uh, grocery stores, his response was to penalize the owners of grocery stores uh, for charging too much for their food, driving many of them out of, uh, out of business. The, the exchange rate um, began to widen. There, there's two different exchange rates in Venezuela, and they began to uh, separate. They, um, it's, it's often the case in countries with controlled exchange rates that there's a black market rate. The black market rate in the time that I arrived was 10 times the, the official value, and so there was quite a lot of corruption as people could buy dollars cheaply and then sell them for 10, uh, for ten times the, uh, the price on the market, um, which generates a fair amount of economic disruption but is quite manageable. By the time that I had left, that the divergence was, uh, was more than 1,000. So you could, take a uh, uh, you could buy a dollar bill for 0.1 cent if you had access to that exchange rate and then go into the market and sell it for... Um, for, uh, for a thousand times that in, in Bolivars and then just do the cycle over and over again. 
um, when there were quite obvious ways of reforming the economic system so that the resources that Venezuelans desperately needed to grow food and to buy food uh, were at hand, the Maduro presidency continued to fall back on its desire to find a, to, to blame the, uh, the, the rich and the Americans for their, uh, for the, uh, for the economic policies. By 2015, so a year later, um, discontent with the Maduro regime had grown to the extent that at the subsequent parliamentary elections, there was a crushing victory for the opposition forces. And this was a moment of hope in Venezuelan society. Both the Venezuelans um, believed that they had elected uh, a legislature and had demonstrated what their, the national will was to, to take some kind of measures on the economic front, but also on the diplomatic uh, community. I remember many fellow ambassadors thinking, well, now that there's a division of power, but the legislative branch controlled by one series of parties and the executive branch controlled by another, this should force the kind of negotiation and consensus building and uh, deal making um, that can finally introduce a period of much needed economic reforms. And yet the opposite happened. The election of uh, the opposition to control the National Assembly ushered in a new era of confrontation. Within a few days of that National Assembly taking office, the Maduro government declared a state of emergency and um, forcibly removed some of the, de from the deputies from that, uh, from that legislature. Three months later, the Supreme Court, controlled by the Maduro government, had declared that every single piece of legislation coming out of the legislature was unconstitutional. Uh, by definition, the National Assembly essentially was, was completely isolated and made uh, absolutely redundant. Because the courts had already become totally dominated by the, by the presidency, because media had already been uh, unable to report on what was happening in the country, um, and because the civil service itself had been paralyzed by, uh, by these years and years of criticism, the institutions of the country were essentially paralyzed and there was no capacity for the body politic to reach some kind of conclusion, some kind of resolution of the severity of the economic crisis. Essentially, populism had brought Venezuela to the state that the nation could not make decisions. And that is, I believe, the principal reason why the economic crisis has escalated to the problem that it, it escalated it's now reached. Now, this was um, about 2016 at this point that it was clear that the the political system was so fundamentally broken and the, the scale of the economic crisis re reached such epidemic proportions. At that same time in the United States, uh, a candidate for political office was using a new and seemingly quite novel playbook in order to gain power. Initially, Donald Trump was covered in the Huffington Post as an uh, entertainment story, so little credibility was given to his uh, political programs. And I remember in that year, watching the American election from Caracas, that there was a con continual expression of surprise by media observers about the tactics that Donald Trump was using on his pursuit of, the of becoming the Republican candidate, and then once he won that, in his pursuit of the presidency. But there seemed nothing surprising from the perspective uh, that I was, uh, from my perspective sitting where I was in Caracas, because the same four rules the same playbook that Chavez had developed and that Maduro had implemented were being introduced. Admittedly, this is a very different uh, policy. There's a different set of policy prescriptions. The, the policies that uh, Maduro is proposing and the policies that, a Maduro, that a Trump are, pr are producing are very different, but the mechanisms by which they were gaining uh, power, they were making a bid for power and then ultimately exercising power were extremely similar. So first, Remember uh, the, the four dimensions that I mentioned earlier, populists divide. They, in, they focus on the divisions in their country and they emphasize them. In the case of the United States, there had been some very severe divisions for years between the red and the blue states, which uh, Obama had initially tried to attempt to overcome, and in contrast, that Trump had embraced as a permanent conflict, uh, one of which nothing could be done, and in fact, that he then set about uh, deepening. Again, you saw the obsession with communications. This is a, a leader that had wielded Twitter more effectively than any politician 
in history and had used that to establish a direct uh, linkage with the, with the population. And in his choice of topics to communicate, he also went out of his way to burn the middle ground, to identify those hot button topics that would earn him greater plaudits from his base and that would outrage his opponents. And so his open attacks on uh, Mexicans, calling them rapists and murderers, his continual uh, insults towards women and his dalliance with white supremacists seem very difficult to understand if you think that the job of a presidential candidate is to try and build some kind of coalition and try to reach across the broadest set of constituents in order to create an unstoppable majority. That is not the playbook of the populace. The playbook of the populace is to divide the population and to create an emotional bond, whether it's uh, uh, a positive bond with supporters or that bond of outrage and hatred, which is very much the, uh, the objective, so that the, the object of love and the ob object of hatred becomes the subject that everyone is talking about all the time. The total, the total domination of the communications environment is the goal, and Trump proved every bit as successful, as talented at that as Hugo Chavez had. Integral, again, to the story is uh, the tendency to blame foreigners. Now, Chavez had blamed the United States, so obviously the United States is not going to blame itself, and there's no equivalent of the United States that the United States can blame. And so I believe that is where the origin of Trump's anti-immigrant rhetoric came in. There has to be some kind of body of foreigners that have a fundamentally different set of interests to the true people and, uh, and a constant conflict with those foreigners. Uh, in this case, the anti-immigrant uh, platform has become the, uh, the bedrock of the Trump, uh, the Trump political brand and the Trump um, uh, coalition. Not because there's any real threat provided by immigrants, but because they, they are the, uh, the foreigners that are interfering with the interests of the real people. Again, there's an agenda to dismantle institutions as well. We all know that Trump has referred to the press as the enemy of the American people. He has politicized the judiciary in the campaign by denigrating judges and the decisions that they made based on their ethnic, uh, ethnic background. And since he's become president in openly calling certain judges, Democratic Party judges and others as Rep Republican Party judges, he has, like uh, Chavez and Maduro before him, criticized elements of his own administration, the executive branch, which is controlled by the president, um, often being held out for criticism as a supposed deep state uh, all in the attempt to try and remove any check and balance on the power of the charismatic leader. And yet again, you see the same result, not nearly as stark as uh, Venezuela, although of course it's only been two years, whereas Venezuela's been at this for 20 years, but the result is that the United States is headed towards being a nation that can't make decisions. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip beyond uh, discussion of the United Kingdom and how it's fallen prey to populism as well, although I, hope I welcome any questions that we might take afterwards. What I'd like to address now are the claims that populism can potentially, in some cases, be favorable towards democracy. So one of the principal scholars of populism, a man named Kasmud, argues that there's three fundamental elements of populism. The first is that the populists imagine the nation to be divided between two sets of people, what he refers to as the pure people and the elites. And that fact of division is the, the central reality of populist uh, rhetoric. The second is that the elite, um, the claim is that the elite act only in their own private interests and therefore are fundamentally uh, corrupt. And the third is that the pure people have some kind of mysterious common will. There is something called the popular will, which is not the accumulation of the will of individual citizens, but rather a mythic will that belongs to the nation, belongs to the true people uh, of the nation. Uh, Kasmud argues that populism is certainly illiberal because liberalism emphasizes the dignity of the individual and requires that there be processes and institutions by which a nation full of individual citizens, each with their own with their own particular preferences, mediate any differences and seek to build collective, uh, collective objectives together. 
uh, populism rules that out as, uh, as undesirable, and so it's illiberal. He holds out the promise that it can potentially be uh, democratizing in that it can lead to the inclusion of certain segments of the society that have traditionally been excluded or whose political power has been less than those of, uh, of more privileged uh, people. That might be true in theory. It's certainly invoked quite frequently by populist leaders. My view in having seen this happen in Venezuela is not true in practice. The urban poor that I mentioned that were the basis of the Chavista uh, political project were every bit as excluded from real decision-making in Venezuela as any other citizen. In fact, what had taken the place of traditional representative politics in those barrios, the shanty towns around Caracas, was quite a, an artificial and centrally controlled uh, political machinery where there would be uh, neighborhood representatives appointed by the presidency that would claim to speak on behalf of the local representatives and any voices that would disagree with that would be uh, punished with the withdrawal of social services and now the withdrawal of, uh, of food. So the claims for there to be a genuine integration of excluded voices uh, proves to be false in, uh, in practice. Uh, and then because the institutions that make representative democracy representative and that hold power and that exercise of power to account by the population are also being denigrated with free media no longer able, independent media no longer able to provide information to the populace, to the population on what's happening with the inability of legislatures to legislate, with the inability of courts uh, to act in, uh, independently. Citizens actually end up with less power in Venezuela. I believe that's the direction that the United States is heading in as well. Uh, for all Trump's claims to be uh, inc uh, including traditionally dis disadvantages uh, parts of the population into his politics, the dismantling of institutions that give actual citizens an actual voice and that hold the uh, actions of the, of, the, of the powerful to account have become less powerful, less uh, effective, and as, as a result, citizens have lost power. For citizens to have power in an interdependent world where we're all deeply affected, globalization requires two elements. Not only that we as citizens have some ability to hold those in power to account, but that those in power have some ability to shape the events, uh, shape the situations in which we live. And that requires, by definition, some degree of international cooperation, given that the challenges that face us, whether they be social, economic, technological, or environmental, all operate at global levels. And yet, in its inherent hostility for foreigners and for international um, cooperation, populism also re reduces the power of the state to, uh, to legislate, uh, to develop uh, international regimes and international treaties that can help to shape the environment to the benefit of citizens. Not only are they less accountable to the citizens, but they also shed the power that's required for them to provide real results uh, for citizens as well. Uh, this is certainly the case in, uh, in the United Kingdom as they are jettisoning their ability to exercise the decisions that are made by their trading partners in the European Union without, uh, without actually uh, removing themselves from the need to trade or to engage in security cooperation or any other uh, of area of collaboration that Britain would have to do with its fellow European countries. Brexit, as all populist projects, end up by reducing the power that's available to individual citizens. Now, there's two arguments, I believe, for potentially embracing populism from a democracy perspective. The first would be from those, from one end of the spectrum to say, well, the other guys have embraced populism to tremendous and dangerous effect, and therefore, we need to fight fire with fire. We need to embrace populism ourselves in order to, uh, to do battle with them, in order to recapture the institutions that they, have, uh, that they have gained. My view is that this is uh, um, playing the game of the populists and uh, is tantamount to surrendering to them. Because in embracing those same four techniques for whatever your own particular policy uh, prescriptions are, for whatever your your uh, own ideology is. Uh, if you're embracing populism, you're embracing the division of the, of the nation. You're accepting that there is a fundamental and permanent division in your nation. You are uh, 
um, placing great emphasis on communications and the establishment of that kind of emotional bond with the charismatic leader or with the charismatic party. You are um, uh, usually engaging in some kind of um, um, demonization of foreigners or of international relations as somehow being uh, aligned with your political enemies and uh, the institutions that you're attempting to, to, to win back um, are likely to be weakened as well. The other reason that you're playing into the populist game is that populists are looking for that division. So the, the populists of the right want there to be populists of the left to do battle with, to reinforce and provide evidence for, uh, for the rhetoric that they engage with. In the United States, we've seen with the, the white nationalists, uh, Charlottesville and, uh, and others, the delight that they take in the extremely rare uh, situations in which leftist protesters also engage in violence. The, the group called Antifa, the anti-fascists, um, the, the actions of an extremely small minority of people are then highlighted and amplified in the, in the narrative of the other, and it's as if the, the extremists on both sides feed off uh, one another. So I believe that embracing populism is not going to, uh, not to, first of all, it's not going to lead to any permanent political victory. It's going to lead to uh, enduring polarization, and democracy will be the victim. The second argument often invoked for embracing populism is that perhaps there is some validity to this claim that the elite are acting in their own self-interest, that there is some kind of active collusion between uh, privileged people in government and in uh, business uh, and other sectors of the, of the, of the, of the country, uh, and that there is some requirement to break up the elite, um, to distribute power, distribute wealth among the population. This, I think, uh, is the argument of those that invoke the prairie populism of the 1890s in the United States, which eventually created the ideas that became the, the New Deal, or of prairie populism in Canada, which led to the uh, advent of uh, universal health care. It is, again, a very dangerous way to go, though, because unless the goal is to, uh, to be inclusive and to uh, arrive at solutions that will approach the whole population, um, it's, it's more likely to undermine institutions than to strengthen them. In both cases, I believe that it's better to embrace and improve representative democracy than to fall to the temptation of populism. In closing, let me examine the threat that populism poses to Canada. We are a divided nation as well. Every single nation in the world is divided because we're composed of individuals and our tendency as individuals is to seek out that which divides us from one another. And so there are divisions to prey upon in Canada if that is the decision of uh, political leaders. We have our traditional linguistic differences between English and French. As a wide and geographically very diverse country, there are all kinds of regional differences um, that we can emphasize if we so choose. There certainly are privileged people in our population um, and a vast majority of people that aren't privileged. So it's tempting to also refer to the division between the elites and the people in our place, in our country. And of course, as a country of immigrants, there uh, are always new people coming that, are, that uh, come from different political traditions, different social traditions, different ethnic groups um, that present a potential contrast if we want to focus on our divisions. There are certain politicians in our country that have, um, if not embraced these divisions, at least argued that they should be acknowledged and, uh, and that um, it's legitimate to mobilize some against the other. Our former prime minister, for example, Stephen Harper, re recently wrote uh, a book about the rise of populism in which he argued that populists do have a point, that there do seem to be two fundamentally different types of people in Canada as in any other country. Um, now, he doesn't embrace uh, some of the more offensive descriptions of what might divide us as Canadians. He divides us into those of us that are from quote-unquote anywhere, meaning that we are globally mobile, um, that our careers um, can be conducted in Toronto just as well as in Hong Kong or New York City uh, or London, and those of us that are from somewhere, people that are deeply rooted in a particular community. Uh, and he argues that it might be uh, a legitimate cause for the Conservative Party, to whom he's addressing this book, to embrace the people from somewhere 
in some kind of permanent co competition with those that are from anywhere. I believe that's quite a dangerous slope to go down. Anytime we embrace, accept a division between, uh, between Canadians and Canadians, um, we, lead, we drive this country not to a situation in which we can resolve problems together, but in which case, a situation in which we're consistently seeking the advantage of one group over another. Populists burn the middle ground. Is that happening in Canada? There's certainly some hot button issues that we have that could be the source of either, even greater uh, divisions. Um, the, uh, the proper response to the situation facing First Nations, um, the reconciliation agenda um, can be divisive in, in certain uh, segments with some people rejecting claims to, uh, to reconciliation. Immigration can be quite a divisive, uh, divisive topic, uh, and there are no end of national unity topics that we could choose. I think you can measure whether the middle ground has been burned by a very simple test, however, which is, do you think it's possible for you in your personal life to be friends with those from, uh, from other perspectives? On this ground, I think that Canada is probably still doing all right. I, uh, Having lived in a country that's extremely polarized and having seen how polarized the United States is, my sense is that Canadians have not gotten to the point where it's difficult to imagine having a dinner party with someone that votes for a different political party. But once that becomes the case, then I think we need to be very careful. Blaming foreigners, well, we share something in common with Latin Americans in that we have a natural tendency uh, to resent the power and the influence of the United States and to want to distinguish ourselves from the foreign policy choices of the, of the United States. Uh, to a certain extent, that's natural. The United States is a very powerful country, and those that don't have that power um, react sometime in resentment or try to seek to change how the powerful exercise their power. And yet, there are certain powers, there are certain parties that, that tap into very explicitly into that uh, anti American sentiment, which I believe is a dangerous path to go down. On the other side, there's certainly growing uh, criticism of. Uh, civil society organizations for receiving foreign funding, which I never thought I would heard here in Canada. The claims that an environmental NGO, for example, is not legitimate in the, in the criticisms it's making about government policy because it receives money from the Sierra Club of the United States, for example, uh, seems to me, it smacks to me of uh, pop, uh, populist rhetoric. Our institutions, uh, are institutions under threat from populist uh, politicians? Well, it's certainly common in our country to hear denunciations of independent media. Anytime you hear mainstream media being thrown as a, an epithet, I think that's a signal that perhaps this uh, populist rhetoric might be taking hold in our country. There are certainly leaders that have invoked um, the notwithstanding cause. Uh, two recent premiers, for example, in their very first month in power, uh, sought to invoke this change in uh, this exception to the protection of human rights under our constitution. Um, and there were certainly criticisms of the public service in the handling of the SNC-Lavalin um, crisis recently with uh, accusations being made that it, the public service could no longer act uh, in independently of others. These are all relatively, um, uh, these are all, all phenomena that I think uh, are still under control. There's still the dominant norms, I think, in Canadian society remain those of liberal democracy, but there are the beginnings uh, of, of a potential uh, national, uh, uh, populist rhetoric taking over here that I think we should be aware of. So in concluding, what can we do to protect ourselves from populism? I think we should do the opposite of those four. The, the four characteristics of populism um, can be combated by the opposite tendency. So to the extent that populists seek to divide us, we should remain united doesn't mean we should, we should agree with one another or have exactly the same um, policy, uh, uh, policy perspectives, but we should debate our policies always in the, sh the context of what we share, which is our Canadian nationality and our loyalty to this nation. We should defend the middle ground ferociously when people do try to reach for those hot button issues, when people are jerking our chains, as it were, uh, we all have our own emotional hot-button issues, issues that, uh, that, uh, that we're quite emotional about. Uh, 
Um, social media is great for playing those up. I think we each have responsibility as citizens um, to check our emotions where possible and to make a point of trying to understand the perspective of other Canadians. Not while compromising our, our values or principles, but always trying to engage in a, in a respectful uh, dialogue. Um, we should resist ferociously any demonization of foreigners, whether they be immigrants, refugees, uh, or foreign countries or international, um, international institutions. Foreigners are certainly not blameless. There are agendas at, at play in the international system, um, but we owe it to our citizens to try and establish international cooperative arrangements as much as possible so that the state, the Canadian state, can gather as much influence over the conditions under which we live. And that requires positive and respectful relationships with international, uh, our international partners. And when it comes to our institutions, sure, they are not, perfor they are not performing as they should. Parliament is a hundred years old, uh, an institution dating back hundreds of years. Our courts uh, uh, also have a, um, uh, their roots many, many years ago. All of the political processes and institutions that we have were designed before the digital age, and so there's an urgent need to update them, but not to attack them and not to replace them, to improve them, to adapt them to the realities of the 21st century. That's how we build power for citizens. In conclusion, um, I don't believe that this is an unprecedented era in Canadian politics or in uh, the politics of the other countries that I've mentioned. The advent of digital technologies has expanded the, uh, the involvement of individual citizens in political decision, uh, in political debates. Uh, the access that we have to information is unprecedented, and as more voice join in the, voices join in the political process, it's natural for us to uh, fall back into divisions. De Tocqueville, in his uh, 1837 um, book on the United States, praised the unique ability of, uh, of Americans uh, uh, exercising civil society, which he defined as the art of living together. And I think that's the art that we need to practice. As we become um, more and more affected by digital technologies, as more and more voices join the din, as there becomes more and more division and, and debate, uh, online, I think we need to learn this art of living together. And I would like the CIC, my vision for the CIC is that we can be that, in that organization where people, where, where Canadians can learn that art. Where you can have discussions uh, like this one and with uh, people that have different perspectives. We can learn to listen to one another and respect one another. We can share our voice, whether it's in in-person events and the questions that I hope I'll hear from you later on, supportive and critical. Uh, or online. And for those that want to go farther to, to volunteer, I know that the local uh, chapter of uh, the CIC would be delighted to have other volunteers to join its executive board. Like in the 1920s, um, I think our democracy is strong. The traditions of liberal democracy in Canada run deep, but there are alternatives growing in popularity in countries that are quite similar to Canada. And so I do, I believe that we need to build our resilience. I think it's... Uh, in working together that we are going to find the solutions to advance the, uh, to, to the challenges that face us as Canadians more than in separating ourselves into competing between different parts of our, uh, of our nation as populists would have to do. So my hope is that we will learn, whether it's through the CIC or just in our practice every day as citizens of Canada, uh, to build liberal democracy and uh, representative democracy for the 21st century. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Ben, that was great. Will you join me over here? Thank you. Thanks. What I found especially fascinating and oddly comforting as a social scientist is it's always helpful when someone comes and establishes a pattern <laughs> to what feels <laughs> bewildering in the, in the time, can feel bewildering in the times that we're, that we're living. And I think you drew these connections so nicely, especially laying out the foundations of what we've seen happening in Venezuela and then connecting that to the United States. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about maybe some of the cases that you didn't have a chance to discuss, mm -hmm. um, because of course we're experiencing this global rise in, yeah. in xenophobic populism, and I wonder if you would talk a little bit more about what you see as fueling that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if it was just the two countries, as different as they are, 
I wouldn't be as worried about the, the global trend. Um, but the same rule book, the, the four um, phenomena that I mentioned of populism is visible in Russia under Putin, visible in Turkey under Erdogan, in Eastern Europe under both Orban and Hungary, and in, uh, in Poland. Um, I hadn't realized this until recently, but it's actually quite an apt description of the way that uh, the Netanyahu government operates in Israel as well. And so it does seem to be um, an effective way for people to acquire power and to, and to maintain power. Many of them, um, the, some of the expressions are different. As I mentioned, between the United States and Venezuela, the role that um, foreigners play in the, in the negative rhetoric can be different. In far too many of these countries, uh, there is that focus on, on migrants and on refugees as the, um, as the uh, evil other that's invading uh, our society. And so that, that rhetoric against immigration seems to be quite common across, uh, across many of these populist countries. What I was going to say about the United Kingdom is that uh, I don't believe that Theresa May herself is a, a populist. The Conservative Party um, hews to the principles of liberal democracy. But populism has certainly had a massive impact in British uh, politics, primarily through the rise of this populist party, the United Kingdom. Independence Party, which the Conservatives more or less kowtowed to in the 2015 uh, election when they agreed to a Brexit referendum. And then the rhetoric around Brexit was really deeply influenced by, the, by these same principles of populism, the sense that there's, there's a fundamental division between the, the real people and the elites uh, comes out very strongly in the leave rhetoric. The um, blaming of foreigners, uh, in this case the Brussels bureaucrats being blamed for absolutely everything, even things that the United European Union has no uh, influence over. Um, and I think we're all starting to see some erosion in British politics as a result of that. What's interesting about the British case is that the principal opposition party is trying to counter this, not with uh, a sort of recommitment to the European Union, but with a separate nationalist, a uh, separate populist ideology of their own under Labour, uh, where Corbyn is also imagining a permanent conflict between rich and poor uh, in that country. Uh, also turning to uh, blame foreigners for many of the ills that British society and international relations uh, adopts with a very strong anti-American uh, rhetoric, uh, and I think a disturbing level of contempt for the constitute for the the institutions by which British representative democracy exists. So it's manifested itself quite differently, but populism has sort of poured its poison into the British bo body politic as well. So given that this is a global phenomenon, you talked a little bit about the idea of living with others um, here in Canada, mm -hmm. and I wonder, uh, or living with each other and living with difference, I wonder globally um, how you think, what steps you think the international community might take to respond to the mm -hmm. rise of populism? So I wanted to go into the political mechanics that drive populism um, before discussing the phenomenon of immigration in order to make the point that um, the demonization of immigrants and refugees is in, in the, in by, by populist parties and by populist politicians is not fundamentally driven by a problem with immigration. It's not, um, I, d I don't believe it's driven by a an actual rise in crime or an actual drop in jobs um, because I think most analysts will say there's actually not a very strong correlation with either of those phenomena. I believe it's driven by a fundamental nativism in, uh, in populism. Um, that search for uh, an other that you can blame things on. As a result, my, my belief is that we counter that not by engaging in the particulars of the immigration debate. We sh I mean, like all areas of public policy, we should have intelligent policies that make sure that we, have j we maximize the benefits of a certain phenomenon while minimizing the, uh, um, the negative aspects but I think it's extremely dangerous for us to think, wow, these populists sure are uh, gaining in popularity. Um, they seem to be very unhappy about, pop, uh, about immigration. Hey, the immigrants aren't voting for me anyway, so why don't we reduce our targets for immigration? Or why don't we uh, introduce new and unreasonable procedures for, uh, for governing immigration just to reduce the political power? of the populace. I think that actually ends up having the opposite, which is to legitimize the anti-immigrant um, uh, rhetoric and to uh, play into the populist hands. Um, I believe we've resisted that up until now in Canada, but 
Um, the Republicans have certainly adopted that approach in the face of Trumpian populism, and the British Conservatives have accepted that in the face of the anti-immigrant um, rhetoric of, uh, of UKIP and others. So <coughs> we've spoken a little bit about how, um, or we can surmise how the Canadian government might start to respond to the rise of populism here in Canada. What steps do you think that the Canadian government could take uh, abroad to address this issue more, more globally? So as populism has begun to uh, influence the foreign policies of many other countries with this instinctive hostility towards foreigners into international relations, that's posed a threat to Canada at the international level, on the, the level of our foreign policy, to the extent that the, in the alliances and the institutions on which we've depended for our global security and prosperity for 70 years are now under an unprecedented uh, threat. Um, I believe it's incumbent on the countries that remain loyal to liberal democracy to increase the level of collaboration with one another to meet that threat more directly. It involves um, speaking out about the domestic politics of other countries as well. If we know the rise in xenophobic populism in other countries, um, I think it's important for us to begin to speak out against that and to hold those governments to account to the, um, to the international um, norms uh, of the, uh, the UN system that they, that they have agreed to. Um, I believe we've been caught off guard and we've been on the defensive with the rise of that kind of rhetoric. Um, and it's time for us to, for, for those of us that are committed to the international norms that have governed um, uh, our countries and, and the uh, rules-based international order for, s for so long, uh, to start to collaborate. Um, I'm a proponent of greater integration between, or uh, greater collaboration between Canada and Germany, as Germany has emerged as a real leader uh, in the defense of liberal democratic values uh, around the world, and conversely, I think we shouldn't hesitate to be more critical of the United States in the direction that President Trump is taking, as he's not only threatening Canada and its interests, but also threatening the values which have united us for so long. I don't think that's being um, critical of the United States or being anti-American. Mm -hmm. I've always seen some concerns about going too far down the anti-American um, path. I actually think it would be deeply loyal to the United States and to those that are that um, believe in the Constitution of the United States if we were to be more openly critical of the Trump administration. And when those Americans return to power, I think they're going to be grateful for us for having stood up for the values we share in common. Mm -hmm. Okay, I could easily uh, monopolize your time mm -hmm. with more questions, but I know uh, the audience is probably as interested as I am in getting a chance to, <coughs> to talk with you. Um, so I wanted to just alert everyone to the microphones that are here um, <coughs> in the aisle behind these first three rows. There's one on each side. <coughs> so I would invite you to come up and ask questions or provide comments. Um, if anyone like, would like to join the conversation, please um, make your way up to the mic. Please introduce yourself. Yes, I'm Kim Rigel. I'm Associate Director of the International Migration Research Center and a teacher in uh, political science at Wilfrid Laurier. Hi. Hi. And I also do work on living together, actually, but looking at um, grassroots projects in Europe and how through very grassroots projects they bring together newcomers with locals to try to think about breaking down uh, some of the, you know, in, in uh, preventive um, xenophobia coming into the communities. Excellent. So very interested in this. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I guess just following up on Alison's question, I'm just wondering in terms of thinking about what Canada can do, uh, are there aspects of Canadian society that you feel uh, are a model that we should be promoting uh, would be one question. And then the second question, um, how do you see this uh, playing out in the next upcoming election, the issue of populism? I noticed that Trudeau plugged this in in his recent town hall, for example. Yes, okay. Yeah, happy to take those uh, two questions. Um, I, uh, I don't think that Canada is perfect uh, as a, a political system. I do, I do believe we have a deep-seated uh, um, commitment to liberal democratic values, which, uh, which should offset the appeal of, uh, uh, of populism. But there are a few things uh, that I do think um, we can point to as positive science in Canada. Um, one recent one, I think, is a demonstration of the very deep commitment we have to, uh, to certain 
bedrock values, such as the rule of law. The SNC Lavalin crisis um, has uh, revealed uh, the limits to the power of the Prime Minister, which I think comes as a surprise to most Canadians and would be an absolute shock, I think, in most countries around the world, the idea that the Prime Minister can't actually instruct the Minister of Justice um, to exercise an existing provision in legislation to provide a break to a powerful uh, company um, was obviously a surprise to the Prime Minister <laughs> uh, and I think pretty devastating to most Liberals to see this kind of implosion in, uh, uh, in what's happening in national politics right now. But in another sense, as Canadians, I think we can actually be pretty proud of the, um, the fierce commitment that our political system has to the rule of law. Uh, to have claimed the careers of so many powerful men, the Chief of Staff of the Prime Minister, uh, the Minister of Justice, the Minister of Indigenous Services, the um, Clerk of the Privy Council, and the list just seems to, seems to be going uh, on and on. The price that the government has had to pay for what is perceived to be an illegitimate um, interference with the, with the, the rule of law, um, I think from looked on from a perspective outside of Canada, is uh, shows a remarkable consensus across the political system on, very, on how very important uh, it is that, uh, that behavior like that by political leaders uh, be checked. So that's, that's one thing that I think is really uh, quite remarkable about Canadian politics. Um, I think that they are often seen as kind of hokey and perhaps uh, inauthentic or overdone, but the gestures that uh, our political leaders make uh, at reaching out to those of different perspectives and uh, Reconciliation, uh, pr primarily reconciliation with uh, with First Nations, but with any marginalized communities, um, they're they're increasingly dismissed as uh, virtue signaling, um, which I think is really unfortunate because, uh, in the absence of those deliberate um, efforts to bridge out across a political divide or to recognize um, the validity of claims of a marginalized population. Um, the default is to, is to do the exact opposite, which is to, to further uh, marginalize. And so um, uh, this is something that uh, it's um, associated with the, uh, with the liberal government and that Trudeau himself is often criticized for, uh, for perhaps going too far or making too many apologies or what have you. But in, in some sense, those are, those are techniques that help inoculate the Canadian body pop uh, public from the um, from the poison uh, of, of division that's at the heart of a populist uh, project. So I think we should continue to do them, even if it, uh, if it does sometimes seem hokey or overwrought or, or might be seen as, you know, part of a partisan calculation. Like, I, I don't think those, are sh those should be reasons for us not to, uh, not to continually to try and reach out across the, the divide in our society. Okay. Oh, and about the, the upcoming... Uh, election. I uh, can't dodge that one. Um, <laughs> I think all parties uh, are, there's, there's a potential temptation to populism in every single political party because the political party's goal is to uh, achieve power and the populist playbook is an effective way to gain power. And so I'm sure that there are politicians of every single party in, in Canada that are, uh, that are thinking about it and that are, uh, that are exposed to it. Uh, we've seen a populism of the, of the left a populism of the right, and I've, some people have referred to Justin Trudeau as a populist. I don't see it myself, but um, there's certainly been, um, there's some of his critics have certainly raised that uh, possibility. Um, I'm not as worried as some observers about the three principal parties. I think there seems to be checks on any of the tendencies towards, um, towards populism. Um, certainly, the Conservative leader has been criticized for uh, for some of his remarks when he seems to be straying uh, towards an anti-immigrant position or, for example, in response to the Christchurch massacre, not initially acknowledging that the victims were Muslim. If you read, I mean, if a non-Canadian were to read his original statement, it probably wouldn't be seen as innocuous, but in our own context, the fact that he admitted the word Muslim, the, that that sense, that's a a shockwave, I think, suggests that there's actually some important um, constraints already within conservative politics about the, about the direction. Um, ultimately, uh, politicians, some politicians are going to cross that line. 
and it's important for either their parties to bring them in or ultimately for us as citizens to hold them accountable at the ballot box. Um, once you get outside the three political parties, I think though then there's some much greater uh, threats of, uh, of uh, populist uh, rhetoric making its way into Canadian politics. Alistair, please introduce yourself. Uh, hi, Ben. Yeah, um, my name is Alistair Sheldrick. I'm a visiting scholar over from the UK, uh, based at the I IMRC. Um, my question's uh, about the link between um, an anti-immigrant, anti-foreigner rhetoric, which is a key part of populism, and pre-existing policy um, uh, in terms of border regimes. Um, and the reason I ask that is because you mentioned that you didn't see Theresa May as a populist. Um, but prior to being Prime Minister, she was Home Secretary, and she was, um, well, she's seen as one of the key architects of what's known as the hostile environment. Um, yes. So she was, she was actually the first politician to use that term to create a hostile environment for undocumented migrants in the UK. Um, so I just wanted to know, hear more of what you've got to say about the link between uh, pre-existing um, the border policies of liberal democracies and their exclusions. Mm -hmm and uh, the kind of anti-immigrant rhetoric that we've seen with, with populism. Yes, uh, if I remember correctly, when she was uh, Home Secretary, she pioneered this practice of uh, white va uh, vans driving around immigrant populations uh, with threats to uh, the deport uh, illegal immigrants. Yeah, um, so uh, I don't know if that is the Conservative Party trying to protect its right flank by uh, absorbing the anti-immigrant rhetoric of the, of the farther right-wing parties. That's certainly, I would say, is my analysis of Brexit, that um, David Cameron wouldn't have gone for the referendum unless he was trying to protect his right flank from, from UKIP. I'm not as familiar with British politics to know if that's uh, central to the vision of what most Conservative voters want or a party that's trying to... Um, trying to create a, a broad platform that, that uh, uh, to, to build a coalition of support across a conservative spectrum from sort of right of center to, uh, to far right uh, or not. I do, th uh, I do think those are offensive tactics for any uh, government to, uh, to engage in and uh, counterproductive. I suppose what I meant by saying that Theresa May is not a populist is that she doesn't seem to influence, to insist in her day-to-day -day political speech, the fundamental division uh, of the country, and to seek to reinforce that division by continually referring to hot-button um, uh, issues that would divide uh, Brits. Um, she and I think the Conservative Party as a whole have um, uh, adopted a hostility to immigration, which I don't think is uh, befitting a major political party uh, in Britain. And I hope that she's held to account at the polls uh, by that. Okay. Would you be okay, Ben, with us taking a couple of questions and sure. then you respond to them just in the interest of time? Please go ahead. My name is uh, Lynn Kay and I'm a retired citizen. I'm interested in um, what I see when I hear you talk, I hear a story about a uh, passion in the populace, people seem to be more prepared to get out in the street in some of the countries we're talking about. And what I see happening in Canada and in Ontario is um, a kind of cynicism and a alienation from the political process, which is um, probably very damaging in the end. Um, and I see that in our parliamentary uh, processes, things have been introduced, like using an ombuds bill, uh, where in the past it might have just dealt with housekeeping. Now, policy is slipped in with finan financial measures and forcing agreement and consensus by people who might have otherwise spoken out against it. And, and then provincially, I see a rapid introduction of very um, uh, broad um, legislation that completely, for instance, in health, completely redesigns the health system by 
delegating to a super agency that has the authority to declare, declare, declare duplicate services and a, a, an ongoing erosion of um, the voice of citizen, places where the citizen can um, inject into the system. So I find it, like I'm, I find it hard, I, while I see even in the um, emergence of this legislation in Ontario, because the same, the same kind of structure of a, an agency for electricity is being introduced where everything's gonna go through that. And I think that we see that will determine a kind of conformity that's required. Exceptionalism will, you know, be uh, set aside as not something that the public should pay for. So um, I just wonder how, uh, I can see the things you're talking about, the themes you're talking about very definitely there, but it seems to be emerging a very different kind of styling format. Um, you know, people aren't out in the streets, even though they're being, you know, adversely affected in a very profound way. Uh, some, some, many people don't even know what's happening. So, how, like, how do you bridge what you've experienced in Venezuela with kind of the different nature, I think, of what's happening here? Although the same, I agree, I agree with you. We, we seem to be facing the same movements yeah. towards that kind okay. of. Thank you. Want to take another one? Yeah, why don't we take one more question? I, I don't know if you noticed, sir, that there's actually a queue behind you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Go ahead, Shiva. Hi, uh, my name is Shiva Mohan. I'm a PhD geography student at Laurier. Thank you so much for your illuminating uh, talk. I'm maybe shifting gears a little here. I'd like you to comment on this. So I'm training as a political geographer and one of the fundamental concepts that we talk about all the time is sovereignty. So I think I'll be <coughs> asking you to draw from your years and years in public service. How, how do you see, and well, one of the kind of major themes coming up in political geography is the politicizing and weaponizing of aid. And in these more recent times, humanitarian aid, how do you see that mapping onto your understandings of sovereignty? If you can comment on that, lovely. Thanks. Okay. So uh, there's a question about Ontario uh, politics. Um, there is certainly a, a major debate about policy uh, being played out in all kinds of areas of social policy and health uh, health policy being uh, being an important one. Um, I don't believe that uh, populism belongs either to the right or the left, and sort of anti-populism doesn't really belong to the right or the left. There seems to be an ideological battle of right or left being played out in Ontario politics right now. To me, populism is more about the, the process than the, the content, and so the things that I would watch for in determining whether Ontario is engaging or is going down the populist path or not is whether there, there are those same four characteristics present. So in um, attempting to introduce these changes, is the Ford government um, invoking a rhetoric that Ontarians are fundamentally divided between two sets of people, presumably the elite and the, and the people? The fact that uh, the tagline of the Ford government uh, is government for the people already gets me nervous uh, because this idea that the people uh, is, are somehow some, you know, that there's some general will that belongs to uh, to the whole population, but not to the individual citizens, could potentially be a bad sign. Um, but are they actually invoking that in uh, in justifying a certain policy uh, or not? Are they uh, reducing the other channels that citizens have um, to have the, to express their views, uh, or for there to be a check and balance on the on the behavior of the uh, of the provincial government? I think that would be a valid question uh, to put to them as well. And um, are they pointing to some kind of um, uh, nefarious outside interests uh, as uh, just for justifying any kind of uh, actions that they are taking? Um, I don't follow the health debate in 
uh, in Ontario enough to know to to see if those are present or not. But those would be the kinds of questions that I would ask in order to, for us as residents of Ontario, to 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 know if our uh, provincial government is engaging in populist politics or not. On the question of uh, political sovereignty, um, this is. Uh, a concept in which populists and Democrats have a fundamentally different perspective. To a populist, the sovereignty belongs to the state and not to citizens. Um, there's a ferocious defense of the rights of the state to do as it pleases within its territory and to reject any kind of international engagement of any kind because the rights that matter to the populist are not the rights of the citizen. They're the rights of the, the government that is, of course, run by the populist uh, leader in this case. I think the democratic conception of sovereignty that should be popular sovereignty, which means that the, the in individual citizens of the country uh, are where final political authority should lie, um, and that those that are exercising power over citizens must be held accountable to the higher power, and the higher power is the, the citizenry. Um, I don't know if you're referring to the Venezuelan experience in particular when talking about the politicization of, uh, of aid or not, but I think the recent situation in which Venezuelan citizens have been desperately trying to get their hands on emergency food and um, medical supplies um, highlights this contrast between sovereignty. So here you have a population that's suffered from massive malnutrition over the last few years to the, the extent that something like 80% of the population has lost an average of 20 kilograms in body mass, um, really severe malnutrition, um, demanding the, the provision of food and aid supplies, and a government that is denying that, not able to provide the food for their own population, but denying it by invoking the sovereignty of the population. So uh, it shows what kind of sovereignty they have in mind. They certainly can't be denying food and medicine to the citizens of Venezuela that are demanding it in defense of their sovereignty. They're, they're doing so in defense of their power as a, a, ruling, uh, as a ruling elite that controls the government machinery of that, uh, of that government. So if anything, the politicization of aid is, being, uh, is, a, is a practice of the Maduro government against the interests of its own population. Okay, um, what I'd like to do, if, you're still, if you still have time for just a quick, two more quick questions. Um, we do have a reception awaiting us outside, so we don't want to go on for too long. But uh, some of you have been standing for quite some time waiting to ask questions. So I'd, I'd ask you to just keep them brief and, 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 and pose them quickly, and then we'll, we'll, we'll sure. wrap up. Uh, go ahead, you start. My name is Christina, and I'm a master's student here at Ball Silly. And basically, I just wanted to ask you, so populist leaders, um, the rhetoric targets um, populations that have suffered the most. How can we empower grassroots movements that despite their economic or social woes, that they don't have to turn to populism? Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's great. And would you like Thank to ask one? Yeah. I borrow your notes. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Pedro Alguindiga. I'm an international student, master's student in University of Waterloo in sustainability management. I am Venezuelan. Uh, ah. Yeah. <laughs> Bienvenido. Gracias. <laughs> I've been here for eight months. I was born in 1995, so uh, the history lesson that you just gave us is my entire life. Uh, you no know nothing but there. Chavez yeah. and your Chavez and Maduro in your all of that your lifetime. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm. I'm going to keep it brief. Um, other than emotional, emotional connection between the government and the poor people, there's also material connection. The government provides homes <coughs> and health care to the people in exchange of support in their politi political events and for votes. Yeah. So how would you think we could fight against this kind of issues uh, this dependency that creates government and uh, reduce the, the ability of the people to take decisions and to like actually be able to go work and make a living. Yeah, thank you. Did you want to take the rest of the questions? Yeah, we might as well do okay. all four of them, no? I'm impressed. Yes, let's let's do it. <laughs> Two more. That's why I'm writing them down so <laughs> okay. I don't forget. Thank you so much. 
Um, my name is Victoria. I'm a uh, master's in social work student at Lori. And um, my question is actually very similar to Christina's who had just asked. Um, a lot of what we learn in critical theory is um, a, a lot of polarization between um, the oppression, uh, the oppressor and the oppressed and uh, many people who are privileged or versus those who are disadvantaged. And um, just considering that um, a lot of policies these days can create a divide where um, it feels like um, the disadvantaged are being take, like um, being targeted, um, especially in current Ontario policy. Um, how do we essentially support marginalized populations without um, alienating um, uh, what some would call the elite or the, um, the oppressor or the privileged? Thank you. Last question goes to you. Hi, my name is Zach. Um, I guess I would be more in the social activist category of person. Um, my question is about the the art of living together um, and just kind of looking toward, you know, the 21st century um, with, I mean, I spend a lot of time kind of analyzing and trying to figure out what's going to happen with climate change and everything that that brings. Um, it seems to me that the art of living for a lot of different reasons is going to be a really important um, thing to hold dearly and carry forward with us. And I just wonder, um, you know, from your perspective, like, what can we do in our everyday lives, you know, in transit, the, where we work, in our neighborhoods? What do you think the, the role of on the ground, everyday, grassroots, uh, art of living, what, what's the role of that in creating countries and uh, cohesive global world? On climate change in particular, or in broader sets of issues? Uh, I mean, I think climate change inclusive of all of the broad sweeping issues that come with it, including immigration from you know, okay. city displacement and food, food shortages and right. many other things that can come with it. Okay, thank you. Uh, so two questions about, um, if I understand correctly, how to empower marginalized populations uh, uh, or how to um, encourage them that there's sufficient uh, benefit to uh, pursuing their interests through existing structures in political society as opposed to embracing uh, populism. I mean, the, uh, it seems to me the answer uh, lies in um, ensuring that the institutions and the processes that we have are fully inclusive of uh, everyone in in the in the population, with this particular emphasis on the, on the marginalized, um, the th the third question was about this. Um, uh, used the terms oppressor and oppressed, which uh, I can understand as analytical categories. Having seen a lot of governments uh, in practice, in our own government, and in um, governments that are uh, either democracies or dictatorships. Um, it's extremely rare that those that have power and privilege, those that do the oppressing, if you want to use that term, are united and cohesive in their efforts. Um, and I think it, uh, not a, it doesn't lead to effective action to claim or to assume that they are acting, they have a sort of perfect unity of action. Um, not only is it analytically not particularly helpful, but I think uh, that le then leads you to the answer of how to um, achieve justice for marginal marginalized populations. If you take it that there's one group of oppressors that are totally cohesive and, um, and operate with a single purpose, and then one whole group of the oppressed, that doesn't suggest that there's ever going to be any improvement because those two groups will probably, you'll probably always be able to describe society in terms of those two. In reality, I think um, both the oppressors and the oppressed, the oppressed, both the privileged and the underprivileged, uh, are very um, the, the multifaceted. That there's actually a great diversity of uh, of actors in both uh, in both sets, um, and the um, and that opens the possibility uh, for 
for uh, positive politics to happen, for coalitions to be created, to shift, um, to appeal to certain people that do have power, certain that do have privileged against others that might be uh, engaging in, in oppressive uh, politics. Obviously, one way to do that is through pursuing political change, so that if one political party's policies have been particularly noxious towards the marginalized, to mobilize so that another political party, even if that means replacing one set of people with a disproportionate amount of power with another set of disproportionate power, it does open the possibilities of policy change um, and, uh, and political change. When uh, politics is less likely to produce uh, outcome, um, there's certain validity for, uh, for direct action, for social action uh, in a variety of different, uh, different methods where citizens are attempting to achieve some kind of positive change uh, on their own. Again, taking advantage of the, in of the inherent uh, divisions that exist within in, uh, any, any society opens the possibility uh, for mobilizing broader coalitions, but the way to do it is to be inclusive and not to um, uh, not to resign ourselves to the the inherent or the permanent divisions that exist, but always look for new opportunities for connections to be made between different elements of the of the underprivileged and also between certain pockets of the underprivileged and certain power centers, uh, uh, certain people that do have or certain actors that do have. Uh, uh, do have power. It's sort of a, a, a general answer, um, but essentially I'm arguing that making representative democracy work generally is going to produce better outcomes for the underprivileged than uh, an embracing, embracing populist politics which em emphasize uh, division and lead to a kind of paralyzing polarization. To the question from my Venezuelan friend about uh, the material benefits that the, ru the ruling party provides to certain voters, the, the term for that in political science, of course, is clientelism, and it's, a, it's certainly a very prominent practice in Venezuela. The few remaining Venezuelans that do uh, support Maduro, which is somewhere between 15 and 25 percent of the population, do tend to be recipients of public services that are provided by, uh, uh, by the government. Um, for example, free housing. Um, so. Essentially, the way this works is that uh, the Venezuelan give, gives away hundreds of thousands of apartments for free uh, to certain um, to certain members of the urban poor, with the explicit understanding that those people will then not only vote for uh, Maduro at the next election, but will also come out when there's time uh, when there's a, a time of political confrontation and they need to have a pro-government march against a an anti-government march, and that's uh, uh, how they get the people to the to the streets. Um, clientelism is a, is a form of corruption. It's a, it's a reallocation of resources in society um, f away from the benefits of the general population to uh, the benefits of the few. And I believe this, the appropriate reaction to clientelism is the same uh, set of uh, policies that are to offset uh, corruption. Uh, not necessarily the, the legal instruments, but ultimately holding the government to account for how it's uh, distributing uh, the resources of the uh, uh, of the government, so um, the way to offset clientelism is through uh, is through representative uh, democracy, because essentially they're wasting the population, the the resources of the population by benefiting that 20% that receive um, receive uh, benefits by taking those resources away from uh, from the uh, from the 80%. And then to the final question about um, the role of uh, uh, of the grassroots in mobilizing. Um, or in this, this uh, practicing this art of living together, I think when you when you look at really deep seated uh, social, environmental, and economic changes, such as uh, climate change, um, in some senses the role of uh, grassroots civil society is more important than that of uh, government. To the extent that um, if uh, society can be mobilized. Um, at the level of, of, uh, of the grassroots for some kind of positive change, it's much more likely to be long-lasting and, uh, and permanent than a change that's accomplished through leg legislation or regulation. Um, when a government legislature les legislates or, or, um, uh, or regulates, there's always a, a loser to that new policy in addition to the, to the winners, um, and they're always able to mobilize to try and offset that Whereas if uh, a change is coming from the bottom up, it's, uh, it's much more difficult to resist. 
I see this in climate change, for example. There's such determined and ferocious resistance to government policies uh, to address climate change. There's such an organized resistance to that um, that I sometimes wonder how far governments uh, are going to be able to, uh, to enact the really far-reaching changes that are needed to address climate change. That conversely, if uh, we're able to operate just at the level of citizens and trying to change our own individual habits and convince members of our communities uh, to change habits, that might have a far-reaching and more, uh, more successful. I, I'm not arguing that that can be done irrespective of government policy, but um, dramatic social changes uh, often have more permanent effect when, they've, when they're being driven from demand uh, in society. Um, rather than being imposed uh, from above. And so, if anything, I think the role for grassroots civil society is, uh, is more important than ever as more and more people are mobilized and have their voices heard in the increasing din that is uh, uh, our, our political system. The less that we have to, to default to government action, uh, the better off we will be. I'd like to say thank you so much, Ben Rosal, for being here tonight, for giving us your insights and so much to think about and also engaging us in dialogue. And thank you all for being here and joining us as well. Please join us outside for a reception in the lobby to keep the conversation going. And please join me in, in thanking Ben. Thank you. And please sign up for membership, thecic.org. We'd love to have you as part of the CIC Waterloo chapter. <laughs>